Okay, young ones, it's time for discussion 5-2. Today we're going to talk about types of chemical reactions. There are five types. So we're going to do synthesis, decomposition, combustion, single replacement, and double replacement reactions. All right, so let's go. Uh, first, let's talk about some vocabulary you'll see when uh, working with chemical uh, equations. So we have reactants and product. Reactants are called that because they are the substances that react together when a chemical reaction take, takes place. Products are the things that are produced in a chemical reaction. Now, the arrow here kind of shows us the progress of the reaction. So if we look at this generic reaction uh, what do you think would be the reactants and what do you think would be the products? Well, what it shows here is A combines with B to make, that's what the arrow tells us, C and D. So our reactants are going to be A and B, and our products will be C and D. Okay, so let's now talk about state symbols. State symbols are symbols that are used to tell us what state of matter a particular reactant or product is in at a particular temperature. So there are four main uh, state symbols we work with. If you see a little S in parentheses, it indicates that our reactant or a product is a solid. L tells us that it is a liquid. G tells us that it's a gas. And if you see the symbol AQ, that means aqueous. Please remember back to unit three, we mentioned that aqueous was just something that is aqueous is just something that is dissolved in water. Now, there are five types of reactions like we saw in the first slide. Uh, we have synthesis, which are also known as combination reactions. These reactions occur when two elements combine together to form a molecular product. That's why we call it a combination because the two elements are being combined or you'll see it as a synthesis because something is being made. The word synthesize means to create. So we are creating product AB from our reactants A and B. A decomposition reaction is essentially the opposite of synthesis. This is where a compound will break into the elements that make it up. So compound AB breaks up into element A and element B. A single replacement reaction is where one element replaces another. So here we have element A and compound BC. In our products, we have compound AC and element B. So it's essentially here, the A and the B switch places. In a double replacement reaction, we have two compounds reacting together. Usually these compounds will be dissolved in water. Now, in a single replacement reaction, one element replaced another. In a double replacement, two elements replace each other. So here we have compound AB and compound CD as reactants. In our products, we have compound AD and CB. So again, these two cations, cation A and cation C, switch places. And finally, we have a combustion reaction where we have a hydrocarbon, remember we learned about them in topic four, reacting with oxygen. Remember, oxygen is the element that is required for combustion fire to take place. Now, the beautiful thing about a combustion reaction is the products will always be the same. And those products, oops, will be carbon dioxide and water. And of course, you'll get some flames as a result as well. Combustion is just the fancy way of saying burning. Okay, so let's first talk about diatomic molecules. There are seven different elements that occur in nature as diatomic molecules. When we say diatomic, we mean they don't fly around as individual elements, but they combine where you have two elements bonded to produce the molecule. Those seven elements are hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Fortunately, it's pretty easy to remember these because of their arrangement in the periodic table. Hydrogen is, also, is set off by itself in the top left, and nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, the other six, are arranged in an upside-down L in the periodic table. 
Whenever you are writing the formulas for one of these seven elements, you have to write it in the equation as a diatomic. You'll never just write H or you'll never just write O or F. You will always have to write them as H2, N2, O2, etc. There is another easy way to remember. If you rearrange the symbols where you have bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, it will kind of spell Brinkelhoff. Brinkelhoff is uh, just it's an easy word to remember. It kind of sounds like some kind of leprechaun name or something. But Brinkelhoff is one way, a pneumatic device you can use to remember them. Uh, a student a couple years ago gave me another one. Bro, I have no freaking <laughs> effing clue. Bromine, iodine, hydrogen, nitrogen. Oh, I should make this capital because that is for oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. So any way you can remember these is up to you, but you must know that these seven elements, when written in their elemental form, in other words, not part of a compound, have to be written as diatomic. All right, so let's first talk about a synthesis reaction. Synthesis reactions occur when two elements come together to form a compound. So here's an example, potassium will react with bromine. Now, potassium, you'll notice, is not written with a subscript of two because potassium is not one of our seven diatomic elements. Bromine, however, is. Now, when potassium and bromine react to form a compound, the compound they form is potassium bromide, which has the formula KBr. Now, a lot of kids get hung up because they're like, well, how come it's not KBr2? Well, remember, if we want to make the equation balanced, we have to add coefficients. So let's go ahead and do that. Two bromines means I have to have two KBr. If I have two KBr, then I have two K, and then we're balanced. All right, so here are some examples of synthesis. Notice in each case, it's elements reacting together to form compounds. Element reacts to form compound, and so forth. All you need to do is see an equation like this, realize that it's a synthesis reaction and label it as such. The next type of reaction is a decomposition reaction. Again, this is essentially the opposite of synthesis, so I've used the same reaction here that we used to explain the synthesis reaction, only now, instead of bromine and potassium coming together to form potassium bromide, potassium bromide is breaking apart into the elements that make it up, bromine and potassium. So here are some examples of decomposition reactions. Again, in a decomposition reaction, you will always have a compound breaking apart into the elements that make it up. Now, again, you notice when we do this, it's not balanced. If you want to balance it, you have to use coefficients. So we would have to do this. Huzzah. Notice here we have compound breaking apart into elements, compound breaking apart into elements. If you see an equation that looks like this, it is a decomposition reaction. Here are combustion reactions. Oh, remember, a combustion reaction is when a hydrocarbon reacts with oxygen. So hydrocarbon, in each case, reacting with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. Notice the products are always the same carbon dioxide and water. Next, we have the single replacement reaction. Single replacement reactions occur when an element by itself reacts with an, an ionic compound and the element switches places with the cation in the ionic compound. So remember, in an ionic compound, we always write the cation first. So this is kind of like somebody cutting in a, on a dance. We notice here we have orange circle man and we have white circle man dancing with diagonal blue line lady. The gentleman switch places and uh, now we have a new element by itself. So here are some examples. Magnesium reacting with aqueous copper two sulfate. The magnesium and the copper will switch places. So now copper is all by itself and magnesium is dancing with sulfate. Here we have zinc with HCl, hydrogen chloride. Uh, when we uh, react, the zinc and the hydrogen will switch places to make zinc chloride and hydrogen gas. We wrote hydrogen out as H2 
because it's one of those seven diatomics. So whenever you see an element reacting with a compound and the element and the metal, or the element and the cation, I should say, switch places, that will tell you that it's single replacement. In a double replacement reaction, two, we have two switches occurring. Notice here we have green with pink and white with blue. On our product side, we have white with pink and green with blue. A South Lakes High School, let's get it. Now, sometimes in a double replacement reaction, a oh, hold on, let me put up those words. Oh, wait. Sometimes in a double replacement reaction, something called a precipitate will form. Now, a precipitate is a solid that will appear when the two solutions are mixed. The reason why the solid appears is because one of the products that form as a result of that um, double replacement reaction is insoluble in water, which means it cannot dissolve in water. So while these reactions are happening in water, you'll see that solid appear. It's called a precipitate because it kind of looks like snow falling from, falling from the solution. That's where the, I wanted those words. All right, so here are our example of double replacement reactions. Here we have barium chloride reacting with potassium sulfate. On the product side, the barium joins with the sulfate and the potassium joins with the chlorine to make barium sulfate and potassium chloride. The easy way to recognize a double replacement reaction is because it'll be two ionic compounds reacting together. If you carefully consider what happens, you'll see that the metals switch places with one another. Two replacements occur, which is why it's called a double replacement reaction. So now I want you to pause the video. I want you to look at these equations and identify, uh, first of all, um, I want you to identify the type of chemical reaction. If, I would also like you to balance each equation just for practice. So pause the video and go ahead and do that. Okay, so the first one I see is element and element reacting to form a single compound. That is a synthesis reaction. Here we have element copper reacting with compound silver nitrate. Now over here, excuse me, silver and copper two nitrate. One element replaced another, so this must be single replacement. Here we have a hydrocarbon reacting with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water. That is going to be our, com our combustion. Here we have sodium hydroxide reacting with silver nitrate, two compounds to make sodium nitrate and silver hydroxide. Two elements switch places, so this is double replacement. And finally, H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. Here we have it breaking apart into water and oxygen, so this must be our decomposition reaction. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and do the balancing. Now, I'm going to uh, do this the way I would do it, kind of avoid the trial and error. So here I see I have two oxygens. So I must have two oxygens over here, which means I have to add a coefficient of two, which gives me two copper. So I do a coefficient of two there. Uh, here, over here, I see two nitrate ions. So I'm going to put a two in front of silver nitrate, which means I have to put a two in front of silver. This is a combustion reaction, so we're going to start with carbon, then balance hydrogen, and then oxygen. So three carbons here means I need a three in front of CO2. Eight hydrogens there means I need a four in front of H2O. That gives me six plus four, ten total oxygens on the right. So I need a coefficient of five on oxygen. Uh, here I have one sodium, one sodium, one hydroxide, one hydroxide, one silver, one silver, one nitrate, one nitrate. It's already balanced. All right, now for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, it's a little bit tougher to balance. Um, we have to think about it though. I have three oxygens over here, which means I'm going to need to change the coefficient on hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. So that means I'm going to start by changing the amount of water here. So I know that I'm eventually gonna have to change this. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a two in front of it. That gives me four hydrogen and four oxygen. So to get four hydrogen, I have to put a two on water, 
Well, let's evaluate what we have here. I have four hydrogen, four hydrogen, four oxygen, and two four oxygen. So we know this is balanced. Okay. Oh, I didn't realize I had those things there. Fabulous. All right. Finally, word equations. Word equations are just another way of expressing a chemical reaction. Instead of using formulas and symbols, we use words. So your goal is going to be to translate word equations into actual chemical equation using the appropriate state symbols. Do not forget, you're going to have to remember your seven diatomic elements because you're going to be writing their formulas in these equations and you have to remember which ones are diatomic. So strong suggestion, review the notes for unit three because you're going to have to be coming up with the formulas for these compounds. All right, so here's an example. It says magnesium, metal, and oxygen react together to form solid magnesium oxide. So we have to look at the context clues in the sentence to pull out some relevant information. So first of all, we're told we have magnesium and it's gonna, re and it's gonna react with oxygen to form magnesium oxide. So key things to look for are the words in the sentence that represent the plus sign and the arrow. So generally, the word and, oh, hold on, I bet you that's going to pop up. Yep, there we go. <laughs> so the word, the plus sign represents the word and. The words that represent the arrow are to form, because it sounds like magnesium and oxygen will be reacting together to form solid magnesium oxide. So I'm going to start by writing the formula for magnesium. Now, I just wrote the symbol for an element, so I have to ask myself, is this one of my seven diatomics? And the answer is no, it's not, so we can just leave it as Mg. Now we need to provide a state symbol. It doesn't mention what the state of magnesium is, but to find that out, you can just look at the periodic table we have in the classroom, because it's color-coded. And our periodic table says that magnesium, like most metals, is a solid. Now that's going to react with oxygen, so and tells us where our plus sign will be. And when we write the symbol for oxygen, we have to ask, is it one of those seven elements? Indeed it is, and oxygen will be a gas. Now the, uh, the problem doesn't tell us that. Then, then it says we're going to form, so that's our arrow, magnesium oxide. Well, this is where you have to remember that to find the formula for an ionic compound, we have to look at the charges of the ions. Magnesium's ion has a charge of two plus, and oxygen's has a charge of two minus. So the formula for magnesium oxide is MgO. Now it tells us here that we're forming solid magnesium oxide, but you should remember that all ionic compounds are solid. So you can just go ahead and put an S on there, even if the problem doesn't tell you. And finally to balance, here I see two oxygens, so I'm going to put a coefficient of 2 in front of MgO, which gives me two magnesiums. So I put a coefficient of 2 in front of magnesium. At the end, you can check 2 magnesium, 2 magnesium, 2 oxygen, 2 oxygen, 2 oxygen. So now I want you guys to practice. Pause the video and see if you can write these two equations. Once you do that, uh, unpause the video and you can get the solution. All right, so the first thing I see, nitrogen and hydrogen. That means we're going to have nitrogen and hydrogen. Of course, since I just wrote the symbols for elements, I have to ask, are these one of the seven diatomics? Well, nitrogen is, and so is hydrogen. And we're going to combine to form ammonia, which is NH3. So now we're going to go ahead and balance. Here I see two nitrogens, so I have to put a two in front of ammonia, which gives me six hydrogens. So I put a three in front of hydrogen. Nitrogen is a gas, hydrogen is a gas, and ammonia, we are told, is also a gas. The next one, aluminum and chlorine. So let me go ahead and write the symbol for aluminum and the symbol for chlorine. Aluminum is not one of our seven diatomics, so I could just put the state symbol for solid. Chlorine is, so we have to write it as Cl2, and chlorine in its standard state is a gas. That is going to form aluminum chloride, well, because aluminum's ion has a charge of three plus, and chlorides is one minus, 
the formula for aluminum chloride is AlCl3, and since it's ionic, we know it'll be solid. So I have to go ahead and balance this. I have two chlorine over here and three over here. That means I need a coefficient of two in front of aluminum chloride and a coefficient of three in front of chlorine, which gives me two aluminums, so I put a two in front of aluminum. That is it for our discussion. That is it for unit five, so please make sure you review these notes, practice writing formulas for your ionic compounds, and study your types of reactions. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see everybody in class. If I can find my pointer.